Yes, Kia ora whanau. we're back again here in studio, round 24 of Rugby League and what a banger we had. Some big games coming up and it is finals football just around the corner. But before we kick the show off, we're going to bring our crew straight into it. It's Ephraim hanging over there. Dill's at the back, and obviously the man himself, Koro Wurumu, he's here again. How was your weekend, brothers? Oh, it was pretty good, eh? Hey, he, he always <laughs> brings no energy, bro. I had hectic, a mean Mario had a hectic weekend. <laughs> busy. Busy as. Willie was busy. He was busy. Hectic. Full, full weekend of sport. No local stuff. Had nothing on. Sat on the couch in front of the fire watching <laughs> everything. <laughs> Loved it. So Willie, so Willie got all rugby league and over the weekend, so he's going to have some cool quarter cool today all on our show. But before we kick off our show and before I go to Ethram to tell us what's happening, don't forget to check us all out. Hey, guys, we're all up on – we're a podcast as well on Apple and Spotify and also every Mondays on our YouTube channel and our TikTok, which is Run It Straight for both. We do a live from 9.15 to 9.45 for all you fans and all your audience and our subscribers that come in. So make sure you like, subscribe, share all this information, and it'll be nice to see you all here Monday live 9.15 to 9.45. But anyways, enough of my talking. Let's go to the man himself, Ephraim. What's happening, brother? Oh, man, you've got the gift of the gab, don't you, Adam? Thank you, bro. Almost man. like you could be a lead commentator, eh? <laughs> Holy, bro. Did you just take my Tigers jersey? I did. I... <sighs> No, no, no. No, no, I said, oh, no, no, no. No, it's just a beautiful jersey, you know. I was just admiring it. I thought I'd just pop it on well, for today's Well, bro, you were coming up with everything. I reckon, I reckon. Hey, fams, for all you guys tuning in, I reckon there's a Bulldogs one around the corner coming soon. Just watch this space. Watch this space, indeed. But we'll start off the show with the uh, Hall of Fame inductees of the players. Uh, they were named during the week last week. The list includes Lionel Morgan, Les Boyd, Ben Elias, Elias? Ben Elias. Ben Elias. Elias. Right. Steve Renoff, Cameron <laughs> Smith, Jonathan Thurston, Billy Slater, the GOAT, Benji Marshall, uh, Cooper Cronk, Greg Inglis, and Sam Burgess. What do you guys think of those selections? Bro, do your research before you actually start the show. Eh? Surely you could have asked us that name. Ben Elias, bro, legend. If you didn't, like, and he's a Tigers band, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah, nah, nah. What? Let's just cut that part out. Right? <laughs> we can cut it, but we're not going to cut it. We'll leave it in there for everyone to have a laugh. But um, very young, Willie, for, for me, uh, but some great. And I'm most probably uh, from the Cameron Smith, Jonathan Thurston, Billy Slater, Benji Marshall, Cooper Crock, Greg Inglis, Sam Burgess era. So when I look at those guys, I feel like there's some guys before them, especially in the English department that I've heard of. Adrian Morley, for example, that... When I was just coming through at the, the younger ages coming into NRL, he was someone that was spoken about who was an intimidator on the field that had we had created pathways for likes of Sam Burgess. So um, I think there's, is it Ellery? Ellery Hanley. Ellery Hanley. I've heard and seen a lot of his footage. And I think, you know, for those guys to not be mentioned yet, I think when it comes to English people, players that have come over, those guys could have been mentioned in this. But... There's some great talent, some legends of the game. Uh, created so many memories. You know, Cameron Swift playing, you know, over 400 games. Cooper Cronk right up there as well. Jonathan Thurston, who's been an icon for Queensland and, and the Cowboys with their 2015 grand final win. Um, you know, Greg Inglis, I think. I played alongside Greg and admired what he could do. Um, an Indigenous player as well. But, you know, some of those older guys, it's more in um, your era, Willie. But I think um, for me... Um, not a bad list of players that have played in our game that are legends. Yeah, I think first and foremost, every one of those players deserves to be there. What my question is, uh, some of the timing of it, you know, and are there some others before, as Blair has alluded to, that should be in there as well? Um, what I've got to be careful of is because I don't understand is the criteria of selection. Mm. Mm. What you've got to... I know in, in the American sports, you've got to be retired five years and there's a whole lot of other stuff that you've got to fulfill. Um, that's what I need to understand first and foremost before I really dig into this. But yeah, Adrian Morley, he's one of them. The GOAT to a lot of English rugby league fans and supporters is Ellery. He's the GOAT, came over and played for Western Suburbs and he played for the Balmain Tigers. And then there's Malcolm Reilly. Um, who was a grand final winner with Manly in the 70s, but also won a grand final as the Newcastle Knights head coach in 97. 
So he's another one who could be in with a shout. But there's so many others. I know that I've read, interestingly, that Steve Roach came out and he was questioning the selection of Les Boyd because of his disciplinary record. But you know, um, there's so many other names that could go in there as well. And I'm not going to, for one second, um, yeah. say that any of these blokes do not deserve, because they do. Mm. You know, they do deserve to be there. It's just the timing and who else could be in there at this moment in time. But yeah, that's, that's a great list of that. Now, all those guys are all quality players. Moving along to uh, the NRL is planning to stage a mini Olympics, they're calling it, uh, on grand final day from now on until, you know, indefinitely. Uh, starting off with a 100-metre sprint race between all of the NRL's fastest players, which everyone always loves talking about. We've talked about it a bit before as well, but... Not only that, the plan is to include stuff like a goal-kicking competition, a fastest forward sprint and a kickoff sprint, uh, a biggest boot in-game and all these different kinds of events. That's what they want to expand it to. I think this year it's only going to be the 100 metres uh, just because of getting sponsorship, but that's an exciting you know, spectacle element to add to Grand Final Day in the future. Um, yeah, what more do they want to add to the game? Because we're talking about how long the season is. Um, we're talking about how important international rugby league is. They've got this preseason trial that they've turned into a little bit of a competition. I know this is exciting. I know this is exciting. Everyone wants to see these races, uh, especially the 100. They all want to know who the fastest back is, and they've all got their decision on who they think it is. Saab, the Fox, Hammer, seen over the weekend. Um, but you may not have those fastest guys come grand final day because they could be playing in the grand final. So it doesn't really make sense if, you know, that say, for example, at Okar and Saab are playing in a grand final, just saying they're not going to be there on grand final day. And do they want to put themselves at risk to, on grand final day if they're not playing, that they could be an opportunity to play international stuff and do an injury and these kind of things where it's just a spectacle for the fans. and. I, I just think I, I like the idea. I like the idea. I think this is exciting and for the audience, and everyone's got this on there, asking these questions around they want to see it. But I just think it's measurably um, something they have to actually think about it a little bit harder. Uh, and especially, I think the RLPA will come in on this as well. There's a lot of red tape around all these kind of things. Um, the same as trying to get players into like international team just to be in the reserves to help with trainings. It's hard to get those guys in, and then you've got to put them on a big stage here. The RRP will have something to say about this, I think. Yeah, there's a couple of things that come into my mind, first and foremost, when when I read this. Um, first one was, uh, game, grand final day is busy. Mm. It's a packed out day. There's three big games with the women and the cup, and then obviously the first great grand final. And I think those games deserve to be celebrated in their own right especially the main grand final. That's, that's the showpiece of our game, of our year, of our season. Um, I, th I also think back to NFL and what they do in the build-up to their Super Bowl. They have the All-Star game, and that All-Star week has things like this. Mm -hmm. It has players doing things. It has the quarterback throws. It has the kicking mm -hmm. comp. It has what was a game. Now it's just a game of tag or flag football. We could have a game of touch, essentially, just a showpiece. Um, players who aren't involved in internationals and I think that would be a good way to do some of this throughout the week in the lead up to the grand mm. final that could be something as a as part of the week's festival rather than on the day that's just me thinking mm. immediately and sense. coming out with it and I'd, I think it'd be great to do something like that and it would answer a lot of questions yeah. <laughs> but obviously a bit like the Super Bowl and the all-star game you don't have the luxury of having the players who are involved in the final they're exempt from any of this. Yeah. They've got grand finals to worry about in the preparation for their big mm. game. So anybody else in the comp, you could be able to get them. You know, and get them in there, attract some of the some more fans to the week and to you know, have it around. I, I think that would be a way of doing it through the week. Mm. Definitely definitely makes sense, Willie Day. So like you said, yeah, grand final day is an important day to all all teams involved and there's a lot of uh, effort and I guess sacrifice and consistency to want to get to grand final day and that moment should be for those teams to be able to soak all in and if you take it away by putting on a big spectacle these little things in between the space I guess you know 
it's, I feel like these guys deserve the time and the air time that they have to be able to create the opportunities that they have got to get to grand final. So yeah, I think you're you're on the money there, bro. During the week, you can have these little mini things throughout the week just to build it up to where it needs to get to, and then it's grand final day should be all for the teams. For the from the players' side, like what you were saying before, it's could be a risk if they're an international player to just put up their body on the line for a sprint race or something like that uh, just for spectacle. What do you think would be a necessary incentive to those players that join into this that it's that you know it makes sense to do it? Well, they have to train. You know what I mean? Like you can't just roll in just because you're the fastest player in the NRL where you think you are. You need to train for, for the sprint. You can't just rock up and just think a couple of leg swings are going to get you through it all, you know, run through and getting all your high speeds up. Like they do specific training during the week to get ready for game day. They have to hit, hit a certain high speeds during the week so that they're ready to go for game day. So they're going to have to train. To, to be able to get this, can you fit it into your weekly schedule before you know the the race? I don't know, but there is specific coaching out there for sprinters. You must be going to have to go through some training methods to be able to get there. So I don't feel like um, you could take this lightly because if you want to be crowned the fastest man, you want to actually put some effort into what you're doing. You're not just turn up and just try and give it a crack. You know what I mean? And part of the attraction will be the incentive. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are we offering as a prize? Yeah, you know that could be an attraction to the supporters as well. You know, throwing things out there, money, car, whatever. Um, Cars. Fans, fans could come <laughs> out. You get a sponsor from, from somebody, there could be. You know, something like that. People are gonna flock, who's gonna win it? Who's mm. winning this? There's a lot at stake because it makes it, uh, makes it an honest and true race then. You know, if there's something yeah, yeah, really definitely. worthwhile at stake. And then, yeah, and then they may train Train yeah. for it properly. Yep. You know what I mean? If, if you're putting a car on the line or a bit of money, you know, some flights to <laughs> Vegas. And to, yeah, to coin an Aussie term, it makes a fair dinkum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing, what, what would you guys like as an event in this mini Olympics to see? Like I said, those ones that are planned to be occurring, but like perhaps, you know, a bench press off or something. I don't know. What would be like an interesting one and some players that might not be in these sprinting events that you'd like to see. Yeah, I think, well, it's, what they do, the bench press for the, the NFL, that would be pretty... Yeah, that's a combine cool. one. Combine uh, one. They do it for the combine, but no, probably be, be some odd ones for me, like uh, getting forwards or front rowers to catch... Um, torpedoes. Catch torpedo bombs. <laughs> Imagine someone... <laughs> now it's hard enough for a fullback or a winger, but you get a front rower to try and catch Burton's bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have a bit of fun with that. Yeah, or, or I think um, there was a show a long time ago that they used to do forwards doing uh, a drop kick, a 40-20, a left to right pass or right to left pass, a chip and chase, something that a, a seven or a half would do, front yep. rowers doing something similar to that. So it would be pretty funny watching some front rowers kick a ball. 40-20 or trying to chuck up torpedoes, you know what I mean? So something like that would be pretty funny. I think they've done that a long time ago. I think I was involved in some of that when I was down in Melbourne, so that was a long time ago. Dummy but half be, passes. Yeah, dummy half are... passes. So things like that, that boards will have front rowers will have to do because front rowers are pretty funny. Yeah, so exciting <laughs> stuff in the NRL Mini Olympics in the future. Just make sure you get it right, NRL, all right? Mm. That's a warning. You better watch out. Moving on to my team, the Tigers. We've signed... Uh, a young player by the name of Jarrell Skelton from the Bulldogs. We've seen him a couple times this season. He's the one who laid the tackle of the year, in your yep, opinion, Adam, yeah. on... I um, can't remember who he tackled, but it was just an absolute ripper. He just cut the guy down. But he signed a two-year deal beginning next year at the Tigers worth reportedly around two hundred and thirty grand per season. Pretty good signing, eh? Not, not too bad, I think. You know, when you're sitting behind a some uh, really good wingers at the Bulldogs at the moment. Uh, and when he got his opportunity, he looked good, he looked strong, carried the ball well, can score a try as well, and obviously on the back of that big hit can tackle as well. So um, hey, when you can pick up players that have got good quality or good skills that you need to help with your team for not much money, and I'm not saying that's not much money, they're still good, good money, 
uh, for any player. Uh, but when it, in terms of salary cap and trying to be able to afford other players to come in as well, I think it's a, a not a bad pickup. I think he's done really well when he's had his time. He's, I think, you know, Blake Wilson, is it Wilson? Yep. Who sit, he sits behind as well. And I think he's even sitting on the side because the Fox is back. So there's some quality players that he's behind. So when an opportunity arises to become the winger for the West Tigers, and if, if that's what Benji's uh, put towards him, then you're guaranteed every week, unless you underperform or you get injured, that you're going to be playing first grade. That's the opportunity you, you weigh up and you take when the opportunity arises. So I think it's a great signing for the Tigers. Yeah, they've gone through a few wingers this year. I think uh, the steady one has been um, Staines. Yeah. <clears throat> on the right wing for the Tigers, but their left wing, they've made some changes. They've got, they had young Luke Loli'i on there um, this weekend. So there may be an opportunity. And at 25, he's got to be looking at being a regular first grader now. And those opportunities, as Blair said, are going to be stifled behind the Fox, Carraz, Wilson. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a smart move on his behalf. <clears throat> smart move on the Tigers as well. It's, it's not a big chunk of their salary cap. It's still a good wage for him at 2.30, but um, a real opportunity for him to do what I'm saying, cement a week-to-week first-grade spot and go there with his uh, his eyes wide open, ready to work hard in pre-season and, and take every opportunity that Benji's willing to throw his way. And our back line next year, man, Buller, Taruva, Skelton, um, <coughs> Dewey, Olam, uh, Jerome Luai and Lachlan Galvin. Bro, the Tigers are just going to win the whole comp next year. That sounds... That's, that's, that's amazing, guys. Uh, as you guys know, I've always been saying this about the Tigers. Tigers 2025, here we come. Uh, but moving on to some less interesting transfer news. Uh, Jason Riles is reportedly looking at Isaiah Yongi to replace Blaze Talangi. Who's, so Blaze is going to the Panthers. They're looking to strip... Uh, Yongi away from them uh, but nothing concrete as yet but that's his first transfer target good target for Riles young you know and anytime you can grab some young kids on the rise from the Penrith Panthers uh, you know that they come from a really good system as we've seen over the last five six years that anyone that leaves they bring someone else below them that comes in and gets a job done so I, I think when there's talk when there's when there's smoke, there's fire, and an opportunity for them to possibly get one back at the Penrith Panthers, yet to be confirmed. Um, but a long-term replacement for fullback for Clint Gutherson, who's obviously their captain, um, and getting older with his with his with the game and where the game's moving, the legs a little bit slower. Maybe moving him up closer to the to the action and playing the kid at the back is is not a bad option. I think. You know, you lose one of your your young best talent, Blaze Talangi, and the Panthers are the, the Parramatta system. You want to try and match that with something else, and he's been spoken about already. So, I, you know, if that if that comes true and it's it's confirmed, not a bad pickup. But there's still so much more work to do, and at the Parramatta Eels, there's so much work they got to do. They're, just, they're talking to people, letting talks of people going. They're going to have to find people to try and come to the club and. I reckon they're going to find it hard to sign players, to be honest. Um, it doesn't look like anything's getting easier for the Parramatta Eels. Um, but if you can try and jag a young, talented kid uh, that kind of builds to where you guys want, where the Parramatta want to go, uh, then this is a start. Yeah, and this goes along with the signing of uh, Bailey Simonson through the week. They're going to announce to keep him. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic that they've been able to get a young fella who was great when we spoke about him the other week. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Yongi was fantastic for the Panthers. You know, and the limited opportunity that he got, he took it with both hands mm. and showed that he's got some quality and he can handle first grade. So, yeah, I think it would be great and whilst they lose Blaze Talangi, getting another young fella in. The big challenge for, for the Eels, they've got to try and keep Mitchell Moses. Mm. And if they don't, it's the... <laughs> the next crop of top talent that they can get to come in because that's how they're going to recruit. Um, whilst he's a great player, he's not going to be someone, a young, he's not going to be someone that makes me say, okay, this is why I'm going to sign there. If you're able to sign a big name talent that becomes available on the market, then it might be, all right, we can build a team around that. Do you understand what I mean? That's the challenge for Jason Rolls at the moment and some of the whispers that 
players are looking to leave and there's always, every week, for the last couple of weeks, there's been somebody rumoured to be out the door again from yeah. the Parramatta Eels. They need some stability. They need to keep signing. They've started with keeping um, Bailey Simonson. They've got to keep working on, if they want to keep him, um, Gutherson and work out where he's going to play because that can have an influence on the recruitment going forward. It's so. interesting that Zach Lomax isn't that kind of draw card after how good of a season he's had already. Well, if you, if you keep your um, their spine together, like you said, Mitch Moses, Dylan Brown, and then you bring the kid in, I think they still need a a good nine to support those guys. I think you need a good nine. Uh, and then you obviously got the centers coming there. Um, I think if you can you can get a nice, good core group of leaders around someone like Isaiah, then I think that would help as well. But there's still, like you said, Willie, there's still rumors up in the air that they haven't yet to have conversations with Miss Mitch Moses. I think Dylan Brown, I think he's going to the WARS. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, so if they don't lock him in, he'll be gone to the WAS. Um, so we want to, they want to make sure that they lock in those two halves straight away, first yeah. and foremost. And if they've got clauses in there, sort those out ASAP. Uh, you get those two locked in, you get the kids sign him up, and then you can work out everything else around that and what you had. But I definitely think they need a, a, a good nine that can help support those halves as well. They like to play a, a big, long shift. And I think last time when they used to have Reed, Reed Marnie, he was really good at delivering really long passes to them because Mitch Moses likes getting the ball wide and, and playing nice and square and straight. So does Dylan Brown. So they need, a, I think for me, is on the back of, you know, reportedly hoping to sign him. I think they've got to lock in their, their, their two halves. And then obviously find a nine that can help support those halves in the fullback. Uh, and then to the other age of uh, other end of the age spectrum for a contract signing, Cody Nikorima has re-signed or extended, sorry, at the Dolphins for another two years, just before his two hundredth game for oh, in the NRL. So that's a uh, good news for Cody. Yeah, good little mate, Cody of mine. Um, took a while. Um, for I'm guessing he was trying to ask for more money, <laughs> a little a little niff. Um, but I think this has been his best year for a long time for Cody since he come on the scenes in 2015 and had that 14 role. I think you know he kind of nearly cemented himself as a 14 for a while there when the 14 position become really important to your team. Um, could cover between I guess fullback in the halves and then in that hooker position or come into the middle of the park. Uh, but I think, to be honest, this year at the Dolphins uh, and the way that they've been playing really suits the style and he looks happy. And, um, yeah, 200 games is is no easy feat in, in the game that we play. And these guys are clocking up some of those big matches. And he's a smaller <coughs> body, so he becomes a target on the field. But I like the signing because I think he's played his best football at the Dolphins. And he looks happier. He, he, I think he lives in the area. His family's all out there. He's obviously a Christchurch uh Born player, but now obviously residing in Brisbane, Queensland, and now playing for for the Dolphins. I think it's a great sign. I think he's been enormous for for the for the um, Dolphins. Yeah, I think this is as much about somebody else as it is about Cody Nakarima. I think it's as much about Isaiah Kator mm. and his mm. development, how much he's come on this year, and they've complemented each other, and their partnership has really flourished and helped each other grow and bring the best mm. out. Isaiah Kartor has really come on leaps and bounds this year and he's spoken openly about the influence that Nicarimo has had on him and how much he's helped him grow and learn. But I think Kartor has helped Nicarima to mm. play some of that best football. They've worked really well in tandem and you know, as a spine um, with Hammer out the back and when uh, Marshall King comes yeah. back, you know, they'll kick into gear, and I think it's a really important piece to the puzzle that Christian Wolf is trying to build for his team going forward. You know, he's, he's really young, is Kator, and he, as you said, he's at the other end of his career, uh, is Cody Nikarima. And so I think he can help balance out and help bring the next one through after him. But yeah, it's a great signing, it's a really good signing. Who, somebody who, um, finding some form, finding some leadership, finding his voice, and uh, he's a, he'll be a real key for Christian Wolf's team next year. 
And then probably the biggest name in all of these transfers, Val Holmes, is off to the Dragons <coughs> a three-year deal starting next year. After his saga of he mm. was going to leave or the coach said he can leave and then he came back and said, oh, I don't want to leave. And then Nick Minute, he's signed to a different team. But the Dragons are making quite a stockpile of players for next year. Yeah, the Dragons are doing really well around signing um Good leaders, I think, and players that have played big games and understand, I guess, the grind of the 27 weeks, but also quality and what they do. He's a great centre. He's Queensland's centre. Um, he's a good winger as well and plays. he's a goal kicker. Um, most people are going to need a goal kicker as well. So all these things come into the planning when a coach is looking and identifying a player. Where does he fit into our, our system? How can he help the players around us with his experience and knowledge? And at the same time, what are his strengths and weaknesses? And if, if his strengths are goal kicking, his strengths are uh, leading guys around him to make the kids better, because they've got a young side as well. But in in between there, there's some really good leaders, um, really good leaders alongside Ben Hunt and obviously Cook coming in at nine. I'm really liking what they're trying to build here. Um, there's still much bigger conversation on Hunt from the Sharks going there. So you know they're building some good. Leaders, I think, that have played big games and have played some, you know, what's he up? Nearly up to 200 games, Val Holmes. And you know, when you when you're picking up players that are in that space, you know, you got them at that high end and in their their quality in their own right. Yeah, it's another win-win situation. It's a win for the Cowboys. Uh, reportedly, they get to release up to 850 on their cap by letting them go from next year. Um, but the Dragons pick up a fantastic player an experienced player who has some experience and association with Shane Flanagan mm -hmm. going back to when they won the title together at, at the Sharks. So there's some familiarity there. And, yeah, it's not too foreign being in either around Cogra, where he was at, at Cronulla, or a little bit further down with Wollongong. But, yeah, the, the Dragons are really putting something together. There's still a chance of making the eight this year with Damien Cook coming in and the quality of player that they're looking at to enhance this their playing stocks for next season, who knows where they could end up. And he's done a great job, Shane Flanagan, in the, in the immediate, but also for what he's putting together for next year. And then the final bit of uh, transfer, this one's rumoured more so, uh, is... Wayne Bennett is apparently interested in Josh Schuster. So it's been a few months since we talked about Josh Schuster and his exit from uh, the NRL for now. Uh, we were saying, or not we, you guys were saying <laughs> that the Storm uh, mm. picking him up could be a good idea. Obviously, they've picked up Stefano now as one of their new incomings, seemingly not going for Schuster. But it sounds like Wayne Bennett, the man, the myth, the legend, wants to go in for... Schuster and offer him his lifeline back into the NRL. Yeah, well, it's it's rumours, and someone's obviously told someone that you know Schuster's interested in, in coming back into rugby league, and, and obviously the rumour will be that the only person that can help him is, is Wayne Bennett. So they just associate it with Wayne Bennett and, and the Rabbitohs, and um, which then puts Schuster out in the media, then clubs start to notice that, okay, if he's if he's keen and willing to come back, there may be an opportunity to put him in. And I think if there's there's two two coaches that can help him, it's most probably Wayne Bennett and, and Craig Bellamy. I think those two guys, with the, with the system and the stuff that they have down and, and the culture that they have in Melbourne, could definitely help Josh Schuster to get, to, to get to back to his best. Uh, could kick him in shape, could give him a better understanding of how to use his skill better. I think he's got so much talent and so much skill. Uh, in moments and games under pressure, most probably lets himself down. But I think someone like Craig Bellamy and their system with the players around him could actually help and guide him and get back to playing some football. And Wayne Bennett, on the other hand, is he's known to take, I guess, these kind of players and then just get them enjoying themselves again. And a big thing for why I went to the went to the, the Broncos when he first got the coaching job was because he believed in, in my ability and he gave me the belief that every time I went out there that I could play the way I, I wanted to play and just got players around me to help and support me and I think he could do the same thing for Josh Schuster. So uh, great, I guess if it's rumours, uh, now he's on the, now he's on people's radars and he either could be going there or I'd love to see him to go to, to the Melbourne Storm and just help and, and be at his best I think would be a great signing. Yeah, as you said, it's a rumour, 
Um, and it's a good rumour mm. for Josh. Um, whoever started as Blair, he said, whether his agent's just throwing it out there, it's made him relevant again. Mm. We're talking about him again. We've brought up his name and we're bringing up a name that nobody's been talking about since all that saga at the start of the year when, when Manly let him go. Mm-hmm. But there's no doubting that he needs to come back to the game. A bit like Tevita Pangai, mm. he needs to come back to the game for his sake and for the game. He's a fantastic rugby league player. He's got some wonderful skill that needs to be on show. But for that to happen and for him to be at his best, he needs to be in a great environment, which is why we said Melbourne would be a good fit for him. Just being down there, being in that environment, around that type of culture would be great for him. But going to someone like Wayne, if this is true, would be great for his life and the life lessons that he would learn. He would grow. There's no doubting that Wayne would embrace him, put an arm around him, tell him how much of a great player he is, how much he's been loved, and he'd he'd flourish from that. But we've got to get him to the game first, get him fit and healthy physically, but also I hope at this moment in time he's fit and healthy mentally and he's ready to come back because he's got to do it in his own time. He's got to be he's got to be motivated to come and make this a winner if he ever comes back. I hope he does. I hope he does. I hope he comes back and shows and fulfills the potential that mm. we all know that he's got. Good luck, Josh Schuster, on your return. We all miss you. <coughs> uh, moving on to the games. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Well, up. we miss him, man. Uh, the first oh, yeah. game of the week was Panthers versus Storm at Blue Bet. 24-22 to the Storm. You were right, Adam. I think you said the Storm were going to win, right? Cracker. Yeah, um, it was such a game. Kept me up to midnight. <laughs> kept me up to midnight. I didn't like that. I didn't like staying up too late. Um, these Thursday and Friday night games, normally I'm, I'm chopping down trees about half time <laughs> and falling asleep on the couch. But this game, um, obviously the... The contest between top one and two and the Panthers and the Storm and yeah, Jerome versus Cleary and and Jerome Luai versus uh, Cameron Munster and Fisher Harris and Nelson and all these big key matchups was exciting. And hence why I stayed up and you know, they go in, I think what is it, sixteen fourteen at half time. The game was it was brutal. It was a good quality match of, of football. And then obviously marked by the injury of, you know, Nathan Cleary and going down off a shoulder injury. And didn't look like too much in it too. He comes, he, someone comes at the line, he ducks under, hits him, lands on his shoulder and kind of, I think he looks like it's taped up too. So he's mostly carrying something in there as well, like most players are at this time of the year. Um, but he's had a lot of time on the sidelines to, to rehab and make sure that he's right. But I guess... The storm hung tough. I thought, you know, like I said, I thought they'll get a job done. It was going to be hard down there, which we you know the scoreline showed that 24-22. Both teams stood up, and then J- Jerome Hughes and most probably doesn't get too much mentions in this because Munster is the money man, and everyone talks about him. Or Will Cleary, similar to Luai, when he's not when he's in with Nathan Cleary, he doesn't get spoken about much. So between all four halves, I thought this was a quality game. Um, Fords went at it. And then, obviously, the best team won on the day. 1v2. And everyone was trying to see who the better team was, who's the top dogs in the league. And I don't think we got a definitive answer, even though the mm. Storm won. It was one of those games, neither team had real long periods of control or dominance. You know, they both had periods where they were leading and then the other would come back. And it was a great seesawing game for that. And I think we saw the true quality of both both teams in this one. That, and we saw the quality of some individuals in, in some moments. Munster did have uh, some moments where he exposed some defensive deficiencies in the Panthers, as did Jerome Hughes. But so did Jerome Luai. I thought he picked some holes mm. in the in the Melbourne defence to set up a couple of tries, as did uh, Nathan Cleary. But yeah, it was a cracker of a game, and upsetting that um, Nathan's injured again. Uh, we want the best players, especially at this time of year, to be on the field. We want every team who's going to be contending in the playoffs to have their best sides out there, so we get a true reflection of what the playoffs truly mean. <laughs> It might be to an advantage of one team and, and they don't really care about that. But as a spectator, as a viewer, this is what we want. We want to see the best out there. But such is the case. Hopefully he gets fit and gets back in well. And looks like Melbourne 
pretty much secured the minor premiership. Mm-hmm. With some rumours that uh, Craig Bellamy is going to rest a few players now. Mm. And I think typical. Yeah, he knows how to, <laughs> how to get it done. To. Deserves to. They've earned the right. They've got some breathing space at the top of the table. Um, I think Munster needs to play. He's got. To, he's mm. missed a lot of football. He's got to keep playing. Might uh, rest Jerome Hughes. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh. If we rest, we can't. Yeah, yeah. He can't. He can't rest Jerome Hughes. The Dally M's on the line. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm Which getting is, to. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I think, uh, for an individual, uh, for an individual, like again, maybe he's thinking about. Maybe he's not. But it's an important accolade to receive to be the best I'm with you. player. I'm with you. In the NRL, no, there's no doubt in my mind right now. I think he's the he's the number I think one he's the leader. to win it. And now that Nathan Cleary is injured and may not be back till the back end of like till finals football, this shouldn't be. And I know I know Craig Bellamy won't be thinking this, but I'm sure he's gonna. I reckon he's gonna rest him too. <sighs> Because I think he's been he's he's played most games this year, and if someone needs or hold on a minute or they need to keep that spine together as well, because I'm getting some consistency. I still think because Munster hasn't been in the in the team for a while, having Harry Grant, Munster, and Jerome in the team, I think that may save him. I think that may save him, but my fingers crossed, Craig Bellamy, do <laughs> not rest him, bro. Hey, that's my Straight argument, too. Straight up, that's do my, not rest him. If I'm talking to Craig Bellamy, I'm saying, hey, you need to keep that spine You're together. You're talking about the spine just to look just after get, Jerome. Yeah, we spoke about it three weeks ago. That's the first time the spine had played together yeah. for a long, long time. You've got to keep them together, yeah. belly ache. Keep yeah. them together. Don't be resting Jerome. <laughs> nah. All right? No, right I if think, you're listening, yeah. you take that on board. But, yeah, I, I think he deserves a rest. I think he does. Well, you were trying to tell, you said keep him on if he's listening. Now you're saying deserves a Rest. But I get it. Yes, yes, yeah. I get it, bro. Because like the most important thing is grand final day and winning winning the trophy. And sometimes something has to be sacrificed. And normally it's the individual because it's a team sports. It's a team sports. And the players, I think, you know, as a player, you don't think about those little accolades. You get the accolades because you play well as a team. Yeah. And then your performance comes on the back of that. So I think he's done enough anyway. I think he's done enough anyway to be able to to still win it, but I would hate for him. Yeah, I think he can afford a, one game, game off. One game off, and then that's the difference between the score at the end of the day for that Delhi M. Because man, he deserves it. No, but this was an outstanding game for one and two. A great way to start the round. Well done to Melbourne. Uh, in terms of <laughs> the game, and obviously two points in it. There was a late penalty mm. uh, for, speaking Fish. of Jerome Hughes, for Fish when he shoved uh, Jerome with three minutes, I think, there was left to go. Yeah. Penalty called, and that's basically the game over was, at that point. Was that last tackle? Uh, yeah, was, I think it was. Yeah, 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 so, it was yeah. so this is like, yeah, I think sometimes in the heat of the battle, it's very hard to understand, you know, the tackling and what you need to do because if you dummy that, Jerome Hughes dummies out, he goes straight through, he scores a try. We've seen Wishart do the same thing between, I think it was Moses and Fish, Moses Lielton and Fish. He just runs, it looks like he's going to sh- go to shape out wide dummies and goes. So similar to the incident from then, I'm guessing, you know, reoccurring incidents, Fish, um, Fish knew that he stuffed up earlier in, in, a, in a play where he should have made the tackle and took a show. And that instant he went after Jerome to play early, took him out. You know, in the heat of the battle, it's really hard to pull out of those situations. But when it's your last tackle, you must be thinking, I can get up and put a bit of pressure on him, but maybe not hit him late. And when we're talking later, it's like seconds, you know, like maybe even one second. Like the ball's must be only gone, you know, two metres after he's passed the ball. And if you're coming at speed, like... I mean, you can argue that you can argue that down to the milliseconds of timing when you've had hit him. So, yes, it was decided by that in the end. Um, you know, but the, the storm had to work hard. They had a guy in the bin, in the bin in, the, in, in mm-hmm. that in that game yeah. as well. Nelson knocked out his own player uh, with a swinging arm that didn't even hit um, the Penrith Dan Dan Laurie. It hit Cameron <laughs> Munster and you know knocked him out. But you know, they had to work really hard for it and got lucky in the end with that call on James. Yeah, back to that Nelson one. When you've got someone the size of Nelson coming in at that speed, I don't know how the referee could say there was moderate force. When the referees are talking about force and the level of force, there's only one level for me in the game. So yeah. how they can say, well, you come in, there's moderate force or light force or heavy force. Yeah, there's only one force. Yeah. 
Uh, we're asking our players, and Fish in this occasion, that we're talking about that decided the game, you've got to go hard from the inside. Go hard. Don't you dare slow down. You've got to get the timing right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're going to get that millisecond mm. wrong sometimes. But that millisecond could also be, for me, Jerome Hughes reads that Fisher's overread, left foot step, brings, beats him on the inside. You know, that's... That's what can happen. So this is why this front row has got to go out mm. and go take him and hit him on suspicion because he could get beaten. Then That's how good Jerome Hughes is. And that's the fear that Fish has. But then Nelson, I saw for Solomon one, yeah, he didn't, I didn't see him really touch his head. No, he just, I yeah. think he might have hit him with his chest or something. A monster. He's, he's, well, I don't know what happened there, eh? He just come flying in and his big body just... Uh, Took out two people with was just his chest. Yeah, hit his, with his chest. Yeah, with his chest, and he's a big man. He's a well, he's second tallest to Ben Takura, I think. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's a big man, but yeah, you know, very hard for that for that for that penalty against James though. But you know, like I said, that previous incident, Tyrone Wishart, dummy on shape, boom straight through him and, and Moses. So memory bank. The Nelson one as well. <clears throat> Obviously, he got sinbinned. The judiciary has come out and. He's getting fined for that. But then Mitch Kenny, the one he did on Grant Anderson later in the game, mm. he's getting a one to two match ban, even though he didn't get sin binned in the game. So I know they yeah. still won the game, the Storm, but like it's sort of like a swings and roundabouts. Yeah, thing. it's crazy because we'll get to an incident in the next game after yeah. the Storm game <laughs> with the first, the first try that they scored. You know what I mean? When they're talking about um, obstruction rules and taking players out that... Uh, are denied to get an opportunity to get into the tackle, which was given a try in the Storm game, which you would have thought, you know, from what we've seen through the year, that that's definitely an obstruction. Um, he has stopped him from getting into the tackle. But at the same time, I would have thought that he was never going to get into the tackle, even if the, the try was scored outside the centre as well. But there's been that many, you know, grey areas this year that it's been real hard to know what's right and what's wrong. And some of the stuff when... You know, in games, there's a sin bin in the game, and then you get back, and then the judiciary comes out on on a Monday, and all the hair, all the um, reports come out, and there's one to two weeks from Kenny. Like it's confusing, and it's hard to understand what we're looking at and what we're trying to identify as, you know, careless or dangerous. That's that's the thing, and you know, when you're a football and you're a league player, like you said, well, there's only one speed. There's only one speed. No one goes into it just to go softly into contact. It's always a high impact contact. The game, that's the game. You don't ever see anyone coming in and just going and cuddling someone. They actually go in there to actually, and not to the point of hurting, but you know, tackle to hurt, you know, which is get your shoulder in, step into contact, drive them into the ground. So there's never ever anything between soft and, and hard. It's always get in there and get stuck in. So that's where it starts getting confusing when they've got all these different rules, all these interpretations that they say it's it's either careless or dangerous. Yeah, the last one that I wanted to chat about was uh, it could have been a real genius play, and I don't think we see it enough. Melbourne went for an optional mm -hmm. restart. Yeah. Oh, for the kick off right. the, the tap twenty, it was a fantastic kick. If they get if, Jack Howard, if, they, if they're out, if it rolls out as it does, Melbourne get the ball down the field. But because Jack Howarth was a step offside, and this is my pet hate as a coach, is if you're offside of an, on a kickoff, a dropout, or a restart, you know, the coach has got to be filthy on them. Yeah, but there was, there was, I don't think, because, so what Penrith were arguing is that he <coughs> tapped the ball and then kicked it, but when they went back, they caught Howarth offside, he didn't actually tap the ball, he passed it straight to, is it Pappy? Yeah. Pappenhausen, yep. Pappenhausen kicks it, which is what you're allowed to do. So I think Howarth was going off Wishart tapping the yeah. ball and then he starts moving a little bit earlier as to get his timing or just push down the field. Chucks, kicks, gets it, mean, perfect. And I'm like, yeah. Well, I was like, how did that happen? I thought he tapped the ball too. Yeah, yeah. That's what they were arguing, Penrith. But it was a bit of, it was a great play if Jack Howarth was onside. But I don't think anyone else knew that it was happening. No. And neither did the Penrith Panthers. That's why it was so good in the end. But wasn't to be. I also heard the commentators complaining that 
Uh, he didn't kick from, from the middle. The middle. middle. Mate, when, does, <laughs> when do they tap from the middle? You know, like the line's there. They go over here a little bit. Like it never. <laughs> Come on. Like we're talking about inches. The same as play the balls at the moment. It's like they're going, oh, he's not using his feet. Well, pull it up then because those are the rules. But they, you don't hear them complaining about those things in the game, eh? But they're complaining about, oh, he didn't tap. He didn't kick it from the middle of the park. But it's like, man, you watch every single play of the ball, which I've seen it come out in the media. You don't hear the commentators going, oh, that wasn't a play of the ball because he didn't put his foot on it. It's just keep calling the game. You know, so this is where the game is at the moment. It's like they enforce these rules in preseason. All these letters come out and they go, bang, bang, bang. These are the rules for the first five rounds, which everyone knows it happens for the first <laughs> five rounds. Everyone's going, oh, the anal on this, this, this. You've got to do this. By the time you get to 11, 12, 13 weeks into the competition, all that stuff's gone. It's a different game. It's a different game. The game's sped up. You're like, where'd this all go to? Because now bro, people are just chucking the ball between their legs. No, no foot action. <laughs> I'm trying to teach my kids to put the foot on the ball. Do we keep teaching them that or do we just keep doing, you know, they're watching NRL. Kids yeah. are watching NRL. And if we're enforcing these rules through our pathways for our kids, then the rule is put your foot on foot on the ball. Like it's real pity, but I think you know it can be the difference between a quick play of the ball and a slower play of the ball, eh? and t- teams taking advantage of it. But um, apologise for babe, that little rant, <laughs> that little rant on play the ball. It's like come on, it's boring. Uh, and with that, we'll move to the next game, which is the Sea Eagles versus the Warriors at Four Pines. Obviously, Sea Eagles won. If we were to go off what the commentators during the game were saying, though, I, apparently the Warriors still have a chance now, even though they lost this game. I mean, yeah, it was kind of crazy what they were saying, but unfortunately, another loss for the Warriors. Yeah, it um, just keeps getting darker at, at the Warsland, doesn't it, inside um, inside their four walls? And, um, I don't know if I saw them beating, to be honest, the beating the Seagulls. They turned up, they gave effort. I haven't seen them not turn up and give effort that many times this year, but just not good enough to win games. I think the best thing about, I guess, the Seagulls is whenever there's momentum, uh, the likes of Cherry Evans steps up, the likes of, uh, you know, Saab, you know, these guys coming around the ruck, like Hopwati, all those guys with speed, creating that momentum for these guys. And you give Cherry Evans a sniff of anything, he can sniff out opportunities through that team. And I thought, you know, the first four sets, the Warriors' defence, I think they held them to 35 metres on four defensive defensive sets in the first, literally four, four defence sets. But then from there, the momentum swings, Cherry Evans kicks a 40-20, and it's, it, it's, it's, different. it's a different game because this is what he can create. So it was tough. It was tough to watch. They tried their hardest. Errors again. You know what I mean? Discipline. When when you're when you're playing the way that they are, you're not always going to get the cause. And I feel like there was some cause there during the game that could have gone their way. Um, the incident I just spoke about the the Melbourne Storm game on that block play. Similar thing happened in in the Warriors game. And was it Badger up in the up the in box. the in the box? Pretty much explained it the way it should have been explained on Friday night. And, and it shouldn't have been a try on Friday night, but for some reason they got let go. So you're assuming after watching Friday, Thursday night's foot, Thursday night footy, that that call was going to go to the Warriors. No, it doesn't go to the Warriors because it's an obstruction. Yeah, well, those are the rules. We know that. But this is the grey area that we're seeing in the game. And um, you know the commentators are saying no try. Everyone pretty much saying no try, but it gives a try on Thursday, no try on, on Friday. So it's confusing. I get it. But again, you know, a disappointing season for, for the Warriors. Uh, they're looking tired. They're looking tired. I think Mitch Barnett, he's put so much effort and work into his season, whether it's been at the Warriors or in, in Origin, that like they've asked him to do a lot of the leadership as captaincy. He's doing a really good job. But so, you know, I know it was wet, but just looked tired. A lot of errors around Sean. You know, is he still injured? Is he at 100%? I don't think he is. Is he playing just to be ready for this game, you know, against the Dogs to get that farewell send-off? Is it fair on the team? Um, he deserves what he what he what he can have on on Friday night against the Dogs, but is it the best thing for the team that he's not playing at 100%? I get that as well. I think he he deserves to be out there on on Friday night in the Bulldogs game, but there was just so many things around him that I thought he's he's just not the Sean Johnson that he needs to be at uh, for, for this game? Yeah, I think 
spoke about this the other day, where I think all 34 players needed to be commended for how they played through those conditions. Because watching the game, you didn't, you couldn't tell how bad it was really until you, they focused on the lights and you saw how torrential the rain was. Mm-hmm. You know, for some of the skill levels, and more so because of the result on the manly behalf from Trebojevic mm. and Cherry Evans, um, they played the conditions really, really well and executed with some fantastic skill. And the Warriors did well after being down 10-0. Um, all of a sudden to get back and make it 10 all. Um, got close to taking the lead just before half time. But they just leave themselves too much to do at the moment. And it's tough to keep fighting back and keep clawing back deficits and, and try and take over the game. Manly, they came in with a, go, a great game plan to move the ball out and expose and tie up the back rowers. There was that try which Trebojevic scored where they moved the ball out to the left. <coughs> it was like a triple and drop-off. It, it's almost like a triple drop-off, but one of the drop-offs holds up Murata mm. as the back row. The so it, what it does, it isolates Sean. But because Cherry Evans is running across field, and, um, the half is running across, he just drops off to Lau. Sean overreads and he misses the tackle. But that first drop-off did a good job in tying up the back row, which isolated Sean. Mm. Well, there was, I there think was that three, was a plan of theirs. Two players that went underneath, then Talal. Yeah, it's a real in that in those conditions. It's mostly the perfect player to be angles. playing because, like you said, is you check the first lead and you go ah, oh, and then the other one comes, so you stop on him to go get him, and then you just have to stop for that second, and then boom, Talal comes under yeah. and it's all over. And just for see. that moment, created that disconnection because Murata came up, Sean went back, mm. enough of a gap for Talal to come through and then get the two-on-one to score. and Manly just took those opportunities more so than the Warriors. And Tough, tough day out for Sean. Tough day in handling errors, missed time passes. Mm. And hopefully um, he can f- rectify all that and the Warriors can get it done from this weekend. But um, it's, it's more than just Sean this week for me. And Adam Fanua Blake's leaving, Jazz. Jess Tavanga's leaving. Could be some There's others a couple well, others, bro. and I hope they get to farewell as much as Sean does. Now, Sean's been great. He's been fantastic. And he's played the most games for the club out of those guys. But they've been great servants too. Mm. Uh, they've been wonderful for the crowd that will turn out on Friday night. And I hope the team can get it right for them. Yeah, I think they should They should all come out together. I think it's important that they honour everyone that represents or puts on that jersey for the Warriors. And and like you and I, I get it. Sean's, Sean's been a legend for the Warriors and you know he's done so much for the game both internationally and for the club for both the Warriors and also the Sharks but so has some of these other guys that are leaving at the end of the year and there could be some more that will go as well that may not get that send off because they haven't made up their decisions yet so the club hasn't as well but you know for all three of those guys that we know of they should all be walking out together and be be celebrated in the way that they should be after what they've been able to create um, for the Warriors, especially after last year's stuff. Jazz, who's been there for so long, come through the 20s pathways, um, has seen, you know, ride the highs and lows of the Warriors throughout his time and, you know, has given his heart and soul to the club. Um, so for them three to be able to walk out together, I think I think if it was to just be one person walking out, I think it's not a, a good look for a couple of those other players that have done exactly you know, has put their body and soul into the club and the joint. So um, let's hope that they all get celebrated in the right way. Um, just one more thing before we move on. I think, you know, get a, get a mention to Luke Metcalf. Uh, I think, what is it, you know, sometime April. April, mm. he, he fractures his leg in, in an ugly incident that happens in the game of rugby league. That couldn't be controlled. Uh, he gets out on the field for his first time this year and I thought he did a really good job. Um, real safe defensively. It looks good when he gets the ball out wider, which we know that he does. Uh, but he'd have so much confidence after coming back and he said, you know, 80 minutes and a 40 minute half for New South Wales Cup and then comes in and plays an 80 minute performance uh, for the for the Warriors. Great signs. I think, you know, anytime, like I said, anytime he looks good at the back of shape, his speed to get on the outside of players, which causes, you know, some some pressure on the defensive line is great. You know, I think the Marcelo score a try. Someone's well out there on that left yeah, edge. First. You know what I mean? So I think he's... He's one for the future. As long as he, you know, and the hard thing, you got to keep healthy and fit. I think he's going to be um, really good for the Warriors in the future. So 
maybe a couple of more games there, then come back down to New South Wales <laughs> Cup and help us finish the season <laughs> off, my brother. Love your work, bro. Uh, just on what you said before about like respecting the players and stuff, I have a bit of a bone to pick with those Manly fans because at half time, when Sean Johnson was coming off the field and he, you know, how they do those sideline as they're yeah. walking to the changing room interviews, he was getting interviewed and then like he started speaking after the reporter asked him a question and the whole stadium started booing him and I was just like, what? Why are they booing him? He's about to retire. He's a legend of the game. I understand that it's the other team, but just say nothing. Why Why did they have to boo them? I don't know. Yeah, a bit unfair because he was most probably the last one on the field signing autographs for most of those players and kids, all those kids, sorry, and, and parents that were booing him at halftime. So, you know, but a little bit disrespectful, I thought, for someone, like you said, has done so much for the game and would always give his time to the kids and parents on the sidelines. So um, those people that boo Boo you guys. <laughs> yeah, boo you. Pick right. away, boys. Wait. Pick away. <laughs> Brookvale. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Stuff you and your family. <laughs> and you seagulls. <laughs> so any seagulls fans? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, Glenn Stewart, right? <laughs> oh, you had to bring up Glenn Stewart. I didn't want to call you out by Glenn Stewart. <laughs> Moving on to the next game, the Roosters versus the Eels at Allianz. 38-14 to to the Roosters. They did what they've been doing the whole season against the lower teams, just absolutely smashed them. Although they did kind of let them away with a few easy ones, but still, Roosters, big win. Man, if you thought, Willie, if you thought mm. the Eagles and Seagulls and the Warriors game was wet, man, that was yuck. <laughs> well, like, called the game off. From the that, start. That was terrible, man. I, like, we should be talking about the game. And I know same thing in listening to the commentators talk about it and then seeing the reports the next day about the field and how they've just, you know, the whole time through the commentary, they were talking about this brand new stadium and that they shouldn't be puddles in the middle of the field while you're playing. And this is not acceptable. And at halftime, you see them walking around off the forks and poking holes in them to try to drain the ground. So I'm thinking, you know, although the Roosters were really good and it was, I think there was this one, it was quite funny. And I showed my son, he loved it. Because obviously it's a rainy lot of slide in the water. I think Dylan Brown gets oh, on the, the ball. He gets on the ball and he slides from about, you know, 10 <laughs> metres out and finishes in the end goal. And I'm just like, this, this is not normal. But my son was loving it because how wet you could do all these slides. But I just don't think um, that's acceptable in our game. And you go back to the football, the Roosters were just on. I think they're, they're understanding that they're coming to the, the pointy end of the season. They're sitting in a good position, you know, fighting to get in the four. They're building some consistency. Tedesco, you know, I think since his origin not being able to be selected in there, I think he's gone up another gear alongside a lot of the other players through there. Um, so I think they are looking like a threat when it comes to these finals football. Um, you wouldn't want to play either the Dogs or Roosters come finals football because I think they've got a side on paper that could, I think the Roosters, for, for me, have a side on paper that could beat any team on their day if they play well. Alongside Walker and what he is able to do, um, even his kicking game is on. Like He's got everything on a string at the moment. He, he's a tough little player. And I think the Roosters will be a hard team to beat if you have to play them come first week of finals football. The the, the, the Eels, unfortunately, just not good enough. Um, they just can't seem to get it right, and you know, there's no point even kicking them down while they're kicking them while they're down. I think you know they've got a lot of work. There's too much noise in the background. You know they're they're playing for next year really and trying to sort out what they've got to do and and get ready for. The coming season, uh, change their mindset and, and get some players in there that are going to make a change. But, you know, the Roosters, good luck. Anyone playing them in finals football? The Roosters, you could see the ground as soon as they ran out. There was puddles everywhere. and Some of them were a bit bigger than puddles and almost little ponds. And see the players, you talk about Dylan Brown sliding. And when, uh, if it wasn't wet, I'm not sure if... Uh, Spencer Lanier gets that first one from out there. Yeah. You know, he almost gets to the ground, but he slides over and mm -hmm. gets a try and good on him. But taking the the weather into consideration, regardless, mm. they were fantastic attacking wise. They one thing I, I saw of them, their their timing and their cohesion together attacking. They run their block plays, 
they're deeper than most teams play, so they're hard to shoot out and, and get. Um, they play right to the edge, and that's why their wingers are scoring so much. Well done, Dom Young, for getting yeah. getting a couple. And um, I thought Daniel Tupo was strong in taking his one, but they're getting some really good service from Soaliti and both Daniel Manu on the insides of them. Daniel. <laughs> Oh, Junior. Joseph, Joseph Manu. Junior, Junior. Daniel. 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 Joseph Manu <laughs> on the centre. Um, even when he made a break and he, he kicked that ball that Dylan Brown had to regather. Yeah. My play of the game was uh, we're talking about Sam Walker, just his little chip over the top. Four, he reads that Gutherson back. is in the line, has to come up his fullback, space him behind, just Tupanua. puts it over for Tupanua. Boom, try. Just smart. Th- that's smart what- football. Smart right kick at the right time at the right moment in those conditions just to hold it up for him to put it down. He does it every week. Every week. He does it every week. He is a smart footballer for a young kid. Um, Anytime someone, the fullback's in the line, he does it all the time and pretty much nine times out of ten gets it right. Um, You've seen Tupanua right on his inside there. They obviously caught it. Um, They obviously both saw Kim Gufferson in the line and puts a little chip over the top. It's It's like... it's that's football one one is is playing eyes up and playing what you see and he is Walker is a big reason why they play the way they do um, you know and everyone kind of just runs off the back of what he does and what he's been able to create and I'm guessing as a coach you're not you're telling him if you see something you play that and you just everyone else just supports and backs it up but nine times out of ten he gets it right gets it right um, yeah they're a quality side man yeah and because Tupano is sitting there on his inside that spooks Gutherson yeah that. Because he's got a bit of width for the marker to come out. Gutherson's concerned that if he plays inside, I've got to still be here. I've got to get a solid tackle on Tupanua. But because he comes up, reads, takes three steps over the top. Just a smart, smart read. And you're talking about Parramatta. They've got their issues. And Jason Rolls is trying to put his on-field team together. And I'm reading that he's got his, his off-field side um, pretty much in place. And just a big shout-out to big Sammy Moore. Sammy he, Moore, he got a role. A, he's, he's on the coaching staff. I think he's been helping out at the Roosters since he, he came back from France. Um, he was doing a little bit of coaching with the Catalans team before he moved away. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I read the other day that he's on the Eels staff for next year. So congrats, Big Sammy. Well done. No. He's doing his time. Uh, for the Roosters, I think I know what you guys might say to this question based on what you're saying about Sam Walker. But do you think James Tedesco is a sleeper to get – all the way to Dally M because I remember when they last did the uh, uh, public polling for the positions in round 12 or whatever it is I'm pretty sure he was fourth or fifth on that list behind the likes of uh, Ponga and Dylan Edwards who obviously both been injured for some of the time and so they've fallen off a bit could he catch I know our favourite's Jerome Hughes to win it now but I don't think he'll get rested for the rest of the year No, nah, well the problem is with the Dally M and how it works is um, there's other players in that Roosters team that plays well, Sam Walker, for example, which then ends up taking points off each other. Um, you know, Joseph Manu, Dominic Young, wingers, you mm-hmm. know, Victor Radley from the middle of the park, uh, Spencer Nenew at times could get a point. So they end up taking, I think this is what was the problem with the Warriors and Sean Johnson last year is that I think there was six or seven players, or six for me, that played mystery career best footy. And every time they played, they mystery pulled some points. So they end up just taking points off each other. So I don't think he ends up getting there because of that reason. He'll get close. He'll get close. But I think there's been a lot of standouts in the Roosters for them to, before James Tedesco to be able to play the way he's doing. And I guess that's how you get those accolades, though, is, is if your team's going well, then you poll all the points, but at the same time, when you think of Jerome, the whole time that he was playing, he's mostly been the only one that's played, well, not the only one, but he's played well, he's been a standout in those in those teams, so he hasn't had Pappenhausen there, he hasn't had Munster there to steal points off him, he hasn't had Harry Grant as well, so he'd mostly poll most of those points, so that's how I see it. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. That's It's been a real team effort at the Roosters. He's got some of the joy on the back end of plays, he scored a great try off a kick chase the other night. But there's no doubt in he's having his best season in two or three. And we're he's back to being the Tedesco that we all knew and mm. loved when he first got to the Roosters and really went to prominence as the New South Wales captain. Uh, he lost that for the last year or so, but he's found it this year right from Vegas. 
from week one. He's been great. So he's in the conversation, but I think for what Blair is saying, it's true that uh, he'll lose some of those points to some of his teammates. The other question for me is, do the Roosters hold on to Sam Walker or does he go to the Broncos for the million dollars that what people are reporting? Mate, he's, he'll go to the Bronx, but I reckon. If they're, if they're going to pay him big money, um, unless unless the Roosters pay him a million bucks, he'll, he'll stay, which I think they can. They'll find a way. Um, I think he's, you know, they've got, is it Chan Townsend coming in, um, which could help guide Sam Walker, but I don't think Sam Walker changes the way he plays. Um, so I don't know what, what Ch- Chad Towns is kind of like. I think Walker is a seven as well. He can lead the team around. I think he's got great qualities, leadership qualities. But I think, you know, if someone offers him a million bucks, he'd be silly. He wouldn't be on much now, to be honest. You wouldn't think so. Because he's but they're coming. losing Kiri, Manu. Yeah. So, so they've got money there to give him a million. So they're going to cu- they're gonna have to fork up a million bucks to keep him at the club. And then someone's going to throw 1.2 at him. And then he'll be gone. You know, it's a big difference, 200 to, you know, 200K on top of a million already. That's, oh, sorry, but he's a good player. I think, you know what I mean? Like, he's a young kid on the rise. He's got so much potential. And what we've seen, what he's delivered to where they are right now, I think he's he's worth that money. And he'll get paid that money too. Some club will pick him up. And if it's not the Broncos, it's going to have to be the Roosters. Moving on to the next game, Bulldogs versus Dolphins at Salter Oval. I believe that's in Bundaberg, right? Bundy, yeah, Bundy. 30 10 to the Bulldogs. But the only thing that it says on the headlines for all of these games is that race between Adokai and Hammer, which, <laughs> yes, that was cool. But I mean, how about that massive score that's been put on by the Bulldogs? But yeah, people love the race thing. Yeah, well, I'll talk about the game before we talk about yeah. the race. Um, <laughs> Please do. Mate, they are, they are a great team. The Bulldogs uh, on the back of on the back of their defence, they have created this style of attack that suits the players that they have. Um, I think for me, Kurt Mann's been a big difference to them in the middle of the park, and then the kid that comes off the bench, what's his name? The Bailey Hayward. Hayward. I think between them, them, them two, I think they've been a big difference to the 13s and the way that the 13s are supposed to be playing this year. Kurt Mann got really great fast leg speed around the ruck, goes to the line, engages line. And similar to what, you know, when we talk about this game changing and evolving, our 13s now have to have quick leg speed, but they have to be able to pass the ball and also run the ball as well. But then link, you're the link to your halves and then allowing, you know, the guys out wide to be able to run what they do. Matt Burden and, sorry, who's the other... The Sexton. Sexton and, and Sexton. I think, you know, Sexton's been enormous since he's been back in the game. They've found... They tinkered with a couple of different players in that position, but Saxon has owned that role, and I think Kurt Mann has helped these guys be able to play the way that they are. Um, through their workers in the middle of the park, your Josh Currens and Reid Marnie, of what he does to your to your edge running back row, like Billy Army Kiko and your captain Crichton on the edges, and then your wingers, Karaz, doing what they do in Addo Car. I think, man, they're, they're a good team. They're a good team, and they've showed that they're a good team too, both defence and attack. So I thought they were enormous, running really good lines, um, you know, and everything, defence and live speed, you know, obviously with that car pick. Any time a ball's on the ground, if he's around that ball, good luck to trying to catch him again. We talk about the catch and getting caught. Hammer, jeez, that, that was a good run. Um, you know, you saw Herbie Farnworth trying to get in the pitch as well, but I think Hammer nearly overran him and just nearly went past him in the end. <laughs> Managed to get him in the line, and I know everyone's talking about it because everyone, like the, the conversation, like we said at the start of the show, is this who's the fastest man in rugby league? And geez, I think at the minute, when you watch Hammer move, he's quick. And just unfortunately for the for the Dolphins, this was a big game, um, and I think there's a lot of teams just below the eight, and obviously the Dragons winning, we're hoping that the Bulldogs beat beat the Dolphins because that puts them into a better position. You still have to win the games. Dragons now in the eight. The Dolphins have fallen out. So this last, what have we got? Two games left? Three? Three. Three games left. Huge, huge games for those teams. And unfortunately, the, the Dolphins weren't able to get it done on, a, I guess, a day for Cody. But also, there's been some some big um, milestones this year for them as well. And obviously, on the back of the resigning, um, just weren't good enough. Herbie Farmworth's been quality for me. He's tried his butt out. He's worked really hard. But they come up against a hot Bulldogs. What are they, seven wins in a row? Eight going on eight, I think they are. 
Is it um, eight? They, they're consistent with their performances. That, and that's the difference is they I, I don't even haven't seen a bad performance. I just think they're just being really consistent and they've only added value to what they've already been able to create. And we've always said, you know, defence wins competitions and you wouldn't want to be playing. If they get in the four and they sneak into that position, then they could be they could be a threat. Uh, they will be a threat, to be honest. They will be a threat. So no, an exciting game for all the, the Bulldogs fans. I'd love to see them um, playing in finals football. I think they've got a real passionate crowd, um, but they could show some other teams what it's what it's, what they've been able to create over these last few years. You're good on the NRL for taking the game out to the country. I love it when they do that. They take the game to the people and the people that can't get out to a game normally and uh, taking the game to a small Queensland country town of Bundaberg. And it would have been massive for them, and it was. It was huge, and it was great comparing the weather from Friday night mm. to watching that first thing Saturday <laughs> afternoon. It was uh, light years apart, but the, the Dolphins, they're still in the fight. They're mm. still in the fight. They're in ninth place at the moment. I think they were eighth going into the game, mm. but with the Dragons winning, they've jumped them. They sit an eighth on 28, I think, and then 26 is, is the Dolphins. I think that's the two-horse race. I think the top seven are pretty much sorted. What position they end up, that's still to be defined. But I think that's a two-horse race. I'm not sure if Newcastle Broncos and the Raiders are really in that mix mm. anymore for that eighth spot. So it's, it's up to the Dolphins, and they've got to try and win their next three in order to really secure it and hope that the Dragons drop one at least to get some points. Because I, I think over the course of the season, if you look back on it, they've been the better team. They've been yep. the... They've had more consistency mm. while they sit below them. The Dragons, they're just finding it at the right time. Yeah. They're finding it at the right time. Shane yeah. Flanagan's done, done a great job to get them to this far. Um, they've got three games to go, and if they make the eight, that would be a huge achievement for the Dragons. But in this game, the Dogs, too good. Too good. They, they have, oh, it's, I've said this before, they were left side dominant to start mm. the season. and They didn't quite have the synergy when they went to the right side, they missed time passes and uh, they didn't quite get the timing right with with Crichton out there. They're, they're full field threat now. Loving right the across shape. the park. Right across the park with Carraz and, and Adokara and Tracy out the back, mm. picking holes and picking teams apart with some quality centres. And um, Bronson Cherry was outstanding, strong, fast, big, dangerous. Big, yeah. big, big, strong thing out there. Um, almost like a Bradman best. But you know, to see him back in the game is outstanding. The play of the game for me was uh, a real smart play by uh, Viliami Kikau. They go short side in the second half. The Dolphins have to pull Tavita Pangai to the short side as the foreman. He sees it's a front rower. Bam. Poor agility. He aims to go to his left for a little bit. Viliami Kikau, which drags Tavita Pangai, just boom, left foot step, sees the space. Makes a break, but off to Burton, they score down there. Just a smart, smart play by a smart, smart back rower. Well, they played a similar shape there where they ran the block shape off Viliami and exactly the same shape down the short side and they get through, someone gets through Cody Nikorima, go down and score a try. So this time, similar shape. Obviously, Tavita comes around the short side. Viliami looks like he's going to play, just goes whack, Dang. boom, see you later, straight for in and another try. It's just, yeah, it's just really good footy to watch. I like the way that they're playing, the, the shape that they have, it's exciting. Like Me you too, said, yeah. uh, they're playing both sides of the football. It's not five drives and a kick. No, they're, they're centres, uh, options, and then they're throwing the ball past the fullback or fast Tracy because everyone's watching for his speed and going to fa cross his face, hitting a centre straight to the winger. I'm like, like Everything they're doing, and then they've got the option to play short through the line on Viliami Kika or running their, their double block yeah. shape, you know what I mean? So, man, they run some good, like, they run the shape, but they're running the shape because they've got threat when they run the straight. Every, every player is a threat when they're running. They're all an option to be hit, yep. and every time they hit it, it's either nine times they get it right. And, yeah. you know, Saxon's been enormous, and obviously Burden with what he's been able to do, mate, they, they're a... Good team. Yeah, they're an eyes up team. Doggies. <laughs> Doggies. Uh, you shouldn't be saying that the week before the Warriors play them, man. Doggies. Wait, <laughs> 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 like you gotta admire good footy. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I like hundreds. I, I, I would have said this last year when the Warriors were playing. I loved what their shape was too. 
But I think when you when you watch a team, and over the course of the last seven weeks, when you see the shape that they're running, they're much more the team that's running the shape at the best in the competition right now because they've got threats both sides of the park and. Anytime they shift the ball, like it's exciting. Like you know something's going to happen, and they're not afraid to play it because I'm guessing it's it's practice, like every team does. It's a consistency. It's the same players on the field. It's timing. Like everything works perfectly for them at the moment, and everything seems to be on the on the high. So, and when you watch footy, you admire the the work that they have to put in because you know we know how hard it is. To be consistent at this game, you've got to be able to turn up week in, week out. And the last seven weeks, they're like they've been enormous, and they're only getting b- bigger and better. And every time they run shape, mate, you got to applaud it when they when they hit the right target. And mate, it's going to be hard for the Warriors, bro. Said yep. it before. We'll say it again. Coach of the year, man. Yeah, coach uh, of the yeah, year. I agree. I just want to read this uh, comment that we got on a poll that I put up last week. Should Jerome Hughes win the 2024 Dally M? And this just shows what Bulldogs fans are like. The bro, Mondi Oso, yep. commented, shouldn't be Cleary or Hughes, should be Jacob Kiraz. He's been a workhorse all season and hasn't had a bad game. <laughs> yeah. No, so, well, Jacob Kiraz for Delhi, <laughs> according he, to Mondi Oso. You know what, bro? Like In the Delhi M's, and these are just how they think out there, is normally goes to these high profile players that everyone speaks about a lot. I'm not saying Jerome Hughes has been spoken about a lot, but your Nathan Clary's, your Payne Haas's, anyone that's in those halves positions, your James Tedesco fullbacks, like the cool positions in rugby league, you know what I mean? The cool <laughs> positions that get paid big money. They're the guys that get spoken about a lot. When it comes to wingers, like you score tries, wingers, you just score tries. You know what I mean? You work hard, you bring the ball back, but the game's evolved. The, the back five now, are your meter eaters. They're your yeah. big carriers now. So a lot of the game relies on those guys in, in, the, in the winger position or the back five to get the team into, into the right positions to be able to play football. So yes, he works hard. Yes, he's exceptional when he's competing for the ball. Yes, he does a lot of work, but so does Brian Tall. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So, so, so does every other winger. So this is the, the argument you can have is that they, are they the highlight reels? And this is, you know, it shouldn't be like that, but this is where it is. Do they lead the team around? You know what I mean? Can they have impact in the game that's going to make a difference? Or do they get put into the space to score those tries? When it comes to work ethic, every winger has to do it now. Like, they are busy. That's just how it is. And then your job at the end of the play is to score a try. Yeah, I think the ones that get the points are the ones that have (laughs) the biggest impact and the biggest influence on the game and the outcome of the game. Not just who scores the most tries mm. or, or makes the most metres. It's who influences the game in the most positive way. And this is why we talk about Jerome Hughes. He's had the biggest influence out of anyone from Melbourne, for me, over the course of the season when they're sitting at the top of the table. I'll use this as a pivot from one game to the next, but it was looking like our pick, you know, as per usual, was doing his thing, Jermaine Asako for (laughs) top point scorer. First to surpass 200 points on the season with his try. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, still looking all goods. But then as we move on to the very next game, the Cowboys versus the Raiders. Yeah. uh, Val Holmes (laughs) got the second most points of any Cowboy ever to himself from last season. Is that 26 points? Yeah, 26 points with three tries and um, how many... Goals was it six or seven goals yeah. or something, and he's just immediately overtaken Jermaine and made our pick look way worse. <laughs> um, he had, he had a field day, but so did the 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 Cowboys. Um, the Raiders again, like you know, I put them in a similar category to the Dragons, although they're they're not with the Dragons, they're below them. That when they turn up and they can play, this is, this is, these are the kind of games that you get. You either get a, a loss or you get the win like the Dragons have, have, have had. Um, they just didn't look like they were in it from the get-go, you know what I mean? And the Cowboys, Jake Clifford, they dropped Chad Townsend um, for whatever reason, whether it's because they think Jake's going to be the, the seven for next year. After that performance, like, there, there's no doubting in my mind that he's, He's someone that's going to help them work into the future. Uh, his first carry, I think he pokes his nose through. He goes up the end, draws him past, comes back to him. Reese with Reese Robson scores a try, and he's in the game. Everything he did 
in that game was magical. I thought he was an outstanding player for them on, the, on that game because they were just quality all over. You know, obviously, Valentine Holmes, like, he still had a couple of... He had some work to do in a couple of those tries, but similar, they're running some really good shape as well. We all know that they can attack. Uh, and the thing that's let them down has been their defence, but this was one of their better games defensively. But, you know, Valentine Holmes and Jad Downs and on the sidelines, I thought, you know, quality game of rugby league for them. They needed this. They needed this. They're, what are they sitting? They're in the top eight. They're the sixth, sixth I think. Seventh. They're sitting at six in the, in the table again. You know, seventh, sitting at seventh, but they're fighting to get up higher. I don't know, like, you're getting, those teams now are fighting to win, but also they're getting their first weekend at home. So, you know, if you can get a, your first game at home, as high, the higher you go, the better it's going to be for you so that you can have your home fans in behind you supporting you. And they'll be a hard team to beat up in Townsville if they get a home final, uh, the way that they're playing, uh, with the excitement they can do. Valentine Holmes, I reckon, has a weight off his shoulder. Um, letting everyone know that he's he's going over to going over to the Dragons, and then he puts on a performance like that. I think sometimes there's so much pressure on making decisions and the media, the outside noise. Once it's taken away, you can actually focus on what you're good at, and which is rugby league. And you've seen how good he was. Like I thought, everything he did was was quality and strong. And yeah, like you said, he's run past Jermaine Osako. Still got some time to go yet. Yeah, disappointed for the for the Raiders. You know, a team who are in the mix of making the aid just or disappearing before they've even really fired a shot. Mm. You know, the last three weeks have been really disappointing for them and they've had every reason to play. You know, we're talking about them staying in the fight for the eight. Josh Pilot is 300th mm. game and they just haven't come to the fore when when it's really been needed, when they've been called upon to, to show some fight. And, you know, go to Townsville and put it on the opposition who were poor last week. As you said, they dropped their half bag. You now they're making some decisions to their spine. Now here's an opportunity to really go get the opposition, but they never fired it. They fired blanks all day, and it was Jake Clifford. Mm. He came out, as you said, right from the start, put his footprint on the game, and I think uh, it's put some pressure on Todd Payton that if yeah. you, th you think you dropped... Chad Townsend for a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've told him, um, I want this job. I want this job here and now. Don't worry about next year. No. I can take this job now, which, you know, if that's the case and Chad Townsend's copped it for one week, fine. But if he... No. It would be a tough call to bring him back this week yeah. on the back of that performance, on the back of that win. Oh, you, you couldn't leave him out. You, you could not have... leave. You can't leave Jake Clifford out of the team uh, for next week. Like, he has to be your starting seven on the back of that performance, like you said, bro. And sorry, Town Chad Townsend, but again, you, you you play with what you have and when you turn up and you get make the most of your opportunity, that's what that's what happens in, in a game of rugby league. And yes, Chad Townsend's on the out, but more importantly, you won the game in style with the seven that you thought was going to get a job done and he got a job done for you. You don't put him in there if you don't trust him. No, 100%. And he's earned it. And he, we've spoken about this before on the show about players going to England and growing and becoming better players. And whilst he was only at the Hull FC for a year, he's come back and didn't have the best time of it. And he reportedly spoke openly about how disgruntled he was and how different the competitions are. Mm. But obviously he's come back a better player. He's come back more mature for it and hungry, spent some time in the cup this year. And even that experience has helped him grow because he's, he's given this opportunity. He hasn't been given too many this year, but he's taken this one with both hands and hopefully for him going forward, it makes him better. Sometimes a bit of adversity too yeah. uh, through your journey always helps. And sometimes you don't want to go through it, but you know, going over to the UK, you know, feeling what it's like over there, knowing what it's like now, putting yourself through it and then coming back, going into, into Queensland Cup, and enjoying your football and then getting that opportunity to come into first grade, which you know you should be there, but you have to work hard to get there. Now there, you make the most of your opportunity. He does what he does against the Canberra Raiders. Good on him for yep. being able to hang tough and stay in it. So, you know, quality player too. Got a good boot on him, big boot, big boot. Like, wouldn't want to catch his torpedoes. 
Even how he un- was unlocking, uh, like, drink water dead yep. in as well. They were looking impressive. So that, the Cowboys will be stewing on that decision because they actually have the bye this week. So <laughs> Jad Townsend's probably going to be sat at home thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to be doing this next two weeks? Well, it was, it was worth four points that game, wasn't yeah. it, for them? So you, you, take, you take that win because it's worth four points and you just work it out after yep. the bye. And Bulldog Seagulls, man, it, they're going to be... About equal on them on yep. points, so they yep. better win their games this week, or they're going to be in trouble. Moving on to oh, Tigers versus Rabbitohs, man, what a beautiful <laughs> game that was! Eh? <laughs> At Campbelltown Sports Stadium, eighteen sixteen to the Tigers. The Rabbitohs were like right. making the charge at the end of the game, but too good from Galvin and the boys early Ooh. eighteen to four lead. They couldn't overcome it. Good on you, Galvin, you beauty. He isn't it like uh, he gets the rookie of the year, doesn't he? Ah, uh, well, from what our when we did our picks, someone told us. Oh, that he couldn't because he yeah. was suspended for yeah. two games. Mm. That's right, man. He's a right, he's a talent. That kid. Um, I heard Benji after the game said if he could rest him, he would have. But they need him out on the field because man, you can see what he does, and he's a big body too. He is big a big boy. body. Got a great ball on him. I think I've seen him a couple of times come down that left hand side and hit that winger on that nice little cutout pass that he's got. And it's a bullet too. I think he's been he's been right up there for one of their best players this year for for an 18 year old kid uh, to be given an opportunity this year and have to have gone through the the craziness of being a West Tigers player. Hey, we're in the West Tigers jersey. Like they they still they're still on the bottom of the table. You know they're still on the <laughs> bottom of the table. Like they they got to win. Like I'm happy for Benji and his crew because I've heard Benji speak about that. They've been in, t- in games where um, you know they've they've played their heart out, but just never got the result. Whether it's been guys getting ten minutes, which has hurt them all year. This is the only time this game, I reckon, this this year that they haven't had someone sent sent in the bin, and the opposition did. You know what I mean? So I thought, you know, for them, for what they've gone through, and for Benji and the players, and the hard work that they've put in, this is a win that they deserved. Although it was nearly taken away from them in the last play, and. I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I, was, I sit on the fence. <laughs> but, you know, who didn't sit on the fence was the ref. Um, she made a call and she was clear and precise with it. And you could either you could have just let that one go. You could have let that one go and just gone, no, nah, that's a try and that was over. But in the big moment, in the pressure of the game, she calls it a forward pass yep. and you got to commend her for having the, you know, what's to make that call. Uh, because, man... Could have easily just let that go, but big ups to um, the Tigers in their first, their, another good win for the year. How many wins is that? Four. Four, four or five. Four wins, you know, and, you know, building some momentum of some of the younger guys that have been out there, you know, that, so they've been working really hard. Um, unfortunately, again, uh, the Rabbitohs through the year that they've had, there was moments in there of, of really good stuff, and then, you know, Jack Wyden's still trying, pushing the line, testing the line with his carries. And then obviously, you know, Cam Murray tries his heart out and just couldn't get that pass right at the end. Man, the, the box was jumping up and down. They thought oh. they had it. They thought they had it. Yeah, and the, the Tigers just did enough. They did enough to, um, to accumulate enough points at the start of the game. And, and Lockie Galvin, that 15-metre bullet pass Mate, that he throws out to Noli'i to score outstanding and flat on the money reminded me of something that Andrew Johns would do and get the ball quickly and just fire it straight out to the wing and then he fired another one a little bit later for a double just uh, for a young kid and the pressure that must be on him to lead the team mm, around wow. his, his halfback teammate set up a great try with a kick yep. Aiden Caesar their first one the first little... one they scored they stuffed their play up and I yeah. saw because I think Galvin was on the short side with with um, Caesar, and then he shot to the open side. He looks at him cross and goes, oh, and then swings it back, back behind his back. But that was, if that was planned, it was pretty good. <laughs> Even if it wasn't, like, it was pretty good. Like, still had to kick that kick over. Yeah. So he had to put the little, that chip over the top and still, like, great try. Real good try. And so they got that, got themselves out to a lead. Souths were real slow getting out of the blocks and... Um, Cody Walker tried to get him going, made a couple of breaks, but mm. tried to be a spark from him. I, I thought it was uh, Keon Kulamatangi late on, just looked too strong down that right-hand side. Back out in the back row, took some handling, set up one, scored one, fight back was back on. and I thought the ball 
slightly came out of the, out of the hands of Cam Murray forward to uh, David Mwali, but unfortunately it was uh, sorry South sit down, it's mm. not to be again. <laughs> but for the Tigers to win at Campbelltown, it's not been the best hunting ground for them. You know, I think they lost nine in a row until they won a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And then they won this one again, so they've put that hoodoo to bed, and well done to them. And unfortunately for them, they're still on the bottom in that fight for the spoon. Cam Murray's stats, by the way, oh, in that game. Enormous. 254 metres run, 54 tackles for two misses. Yeah. He, he's, like, like I said, he's tried his heart out this season, and he was injured for a little bit of that, and then he's come back in the game and tries to be the difference, and leads by example. He's the captain and does everything 100%. And he's hard to handle for a little fella from the middle of the park, but, you know, 30 carries, 54 tackles, like, that's, that's huge. Yeah, he that plays 80 minutes. Really. He must that's, have heard what you said when you were like, oh, he's looking like he's tired because he's tried so well, hard. Well, he does that every week. Mm. He, he, he posts those sort of numbers every week, hence why I think he's tired. No, yep. he, he leaves nothing behind. He's well, that's leader. the type of player he is, eh? Yeah. Every time he puts on that jersey for South or even the New South Wales jersey, like he puts his body on the line and that's what he can deliver. Like big stats, big minutes, every game. He's a difference to them. It's a week of picking bones this week because I have another one that I'm picking <laughs> off the corpse of this uh, dead bird or whatever. Uh, the commentator for this game, uh, whenever... Who was, who was the commentator? I, I don't know his name. I apologise. I don't know your name, who I'm speaking to. But uh, the winger, Luke Laulili, and everyone keeps calling him now because the commentator says it, Laulili. So Lee, I just Lee. have a bone to pick with that. It's Lao Lee Lee. Okay. Is it? Okay, guys. All right. Is it all sorted? Put it out there. Can you give us my, one? My Willie? Tiger's hero, young 18-year-old. Willie winner. will give us a pronunciation. Is he someone? Yeah. What is it, Willie? Look, Lao Lee Lee. Yeah, it would be, hey, <laughs> for our, for those the Aussie commentators, like, you know, in the heat of the battle, but it'd be nice if they could just get it right, eh? It's That's a hard all job. I'm asking. All okay, I'm asking. let's just get it right, guys. Uh, oh, you're on the... one today. Huh? You're on. You're yeah, on a yeah. rant today. I know. I picking know. bones everywhere. That's especially when it's my Tigers boys. You know, I just got to stick up for them. <laughs> wow. Uh, last one on this game. Richie Kenner, three to four match ban for his tackle on Luke Laulili. Uh That was the little drag of the hand across the face. Yeah. Warranted the ban. I think it's because of multiple Previous. offenses. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. That's what happens with a lot of these, eh? Like, if it's your first sim first instant, it's just a little slap on the wrist, and then if you've got multiple, then becomes carryover points, and then you end up having one week off. So, although it doesn't look much in the game, you, you have previous. Yeah, I was Sinbin sufficient. Yeah, but yeah, if he's got priors. Sorry, mate, can't help you. Yeah, it's pretty rough because her man uh, and Tane Milne, the other. Uh, centre, far they're always getting into trouble. Those right. <laughs> they're, they're, they're swinging <laughs> arms galore, eh? swinging <laughs> arms galore. Uh, On to the Sunday games: Dragons versus Titans at Wind Stadium, thirty-two sixteen to the Dragons. They looked good. They, I think, they've been seesawing around quite a bit, oh. as you guys say. But I mean, they're starting <laughs> to look a bit better, you know, with uh, Ben Hunt at his very best. Yeah, well, that's that's the key, eh? Uh, but he can't do that stuff unless his forwards are doing the work for him as well and getting good service and everyone playing their part. Um, when when everyone plays their role for for the Dragons and everyone's consistent and they turn up and perform, like they can win games, but it just hasn't been enough. I don't think they. Oh, do you reckon they hold the eight? I don't. I don't know if they hold the eight. I reckon the, the Dolphins might. I don't know. I haven't seen the Dolphins back end of games, but. They're in the driver's seat for me. Yeah. But I just don't think, like, you, you play them week one, I don't feel like they're a threat to, to a team. If you look at, you know, fifth, which is the Dogs, you know, and they, I think they played them, what, last week? Yeah. Dogs got them. So, and they, sometimes they're playing really well and then sometimes they're not. They're just inconsistent. And, but some of their main players, when their main players stand up collectively as a group, they are, they're a strong team. Uh, Lomax and Ben Hunt, obviously. Um, yeah, so a good win for them. They needed it. They needed to win this game. They needed, obviously, the Dolphins to lose. They put themselves up into the eighth position. Now it's their, their position to lose. And they've come up against a, a Titans team that had a lot to play for, I thought. Um, I think they were just in the hunt mathematically. Their mathematical chance when they turned up. Um, Karen Fawn, who's been a, 
uh, our mate Afala has put his body on the line for for years, man. His his shoulders must be hurting. Um, the way that he's been able to carry on through the tough time of being just a, being a professional athlete and being a league player as a half, I think he was the first half alongside a lot of, you know, your Cooper Cronks that took the ball to the line and got whacked and your Jonathan Thurston's, he's right up there with how they played and getting the ball right to the line and creating the space for someone like Keanu Kinney, who I said earlier on our, our live TikTok that we go live on um, 9.15 to 9.45 on a Monday morning, I said someone asked a question around, you know, who's been like a standout for us and I said that Keanu Kinney's been a revelation of what he's been able to create last year from just being that 14th, 14 on the bench to getting little glimpses of opportunity and seeing what he can show. And this year, I think he's been enormous. I think an opportunity to start the year at fullback, Desi gives him a chance. And then from now on, I think he's he's been huge. What is it, 344 metres and a losing team that I think are better than 16 points. Uh, but outplayed by a, a Dragons team. But if there's been a standout for for me, for a Kiwi player alongside Jerome Hughes, I think this kid's got some potential to be, you know, a, a great player in the NRL, but but also for in the international space. I think he might have some Samoan in him. I better not say that too loud. 100% he does. <laughs> <laughs> he would already know. He would already know. He would I, already... <laughs> I picked the Gold Coast in this one. I just thought uh, after the... The diabolical performance against the Dogs last week at Wynn Stadium. I thought back there again, the Gold Coast flying. I thought they were going to get this one. And when Keanu Kinney goes right. 70, 80 metres, splits them open, sets up Jojo Fafita for the opening try on two minutes, I thought, here we go, we're going to get this. But Ben Hunt st- stepped into the four and started to take over the game and the Dragons were just too good from then on. Uh, unfortunately for... It's sad, you know, when someone's celebrating a milestone, like his mm. 300 and Josh Papali the other week and Foz this week, unfortunately he can't get the win. You know, a milestone in an, in an afternoon you really mm. want to remember. on the, But still a positive. His career's been amazing, amazing to, to walk away and to be a 300 player and a grand final winner. Um, you guys that have done it, you mm. know, it's, it's special. You, you hold a special place in the game and... He sits amongst those people now. So it's awesome. It's awesome that he's been able to do it. He's been outstanding for the Gold Coast this year. Spoke earlier about his leadership um, for that group, for that team, and with that young spine of Keanu Kinney and Jaden Campbell in there. I think he's been a real leader and stepped up um, more often than not at the right times to set up some big plays for them. But wasn't to be. wasn't to be their afternoon. Um, they, I thought... Uh, Luciano Leilua was very, very good for the Dragons mm-hmm. down that left edge. He made a big run there for about 40, 50 metres down the left edge, tried to take on the fullback, yeah. just got, and I thought it was more out of fatigue than not being able to bump the fullback off. He <laughs> <laughs> so was uh, pretty tired from, from then on, but he was able to regather himself and score a try off, uh, off a great play on the goal line. So the Dragons finding some form. And they're in, they sit in that box seat, as I said, they're in the driver's seat, in eighth position, two points off the Dolphins, which means the Dolphins are really relying on them losing one, plus also having to win their next three. But I think having to win two out of three to hold on to that spot, and even if you do, even if the Dolphins do win three out of three, Dragons win three out of three, they've got it. It's, it's theirs. How deep they can go into the playoffs, who knows? That's the excitement and the fun of getting to the playoffs in the first place. You never know what it's like or who's going to win and turn up when it's finals football. For the Dragons, there was one point of the game where they had two sets of identical twins on at the same time, the Fang Eyes and the mm. Couchmans. Those Couchman guys, man, they don't get a lot of minutes this season, but far, they're pretty impactful. One of them got a try and they look One of them set up good. Luciano. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, th- I think the whole thing with bringing in blooding these young guys through is for the next part of their their career, which will be leading them into full time minutes or bigger minutes, so that they can get a bit of a taste of this this high intensity football. The thing when you're bringing young guys through is you don't want to be flogging flogging them where they're till they're fatigued. Is they can bring energy into the team. They can bring some enthusiasm around just playing football. 
Um, but if you flog them all the time, then they get fatigued. You don't get what you need to get out of them. The benefit's not there. But the benefit is for them is to get some consistency of playing in the NRL. And then your next year alongside the, some of the signings that they've picked up on could be enormous for them. Just some confidence with players these days can go a long way. Yeah, you've got to be smart with the young fellas and think about them long term. Whilst also picking up the experience and go back to what you were talking about, um, Lachlan Galvin. What mm. Benji was, he's trying to rest him. He's played a lot more footy than mm. what anybody had planned coming into this year. So you've got to be smart in how much footy you expose him to and how, how many times you're throwing him into the front line and for how long for and build up their minutes, build up their confidence because a, a bad game or two can really dent them and you don't want to get injured as well. So you've got to get them ready for the physicalities and all those sort of challenges. But yeah, the We've got some, uh, we're talking about what they're recruiting for next year, but they've got some mm. through coming through for the future as well. It's looking bright for the Dragons. Yeah, just leave Keanu Kinney alone too. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say um, good luck to them to win the Titans. I saw they Win their uh, first home game for 300 for Kieran Forum, but I just checked what the Roost, game is roosters. and it's the Roosters. Yeah. So. Well, see, They're going to need yeah. a lot of luck to win that. Well, it's the same. Like you, you talk about, we talk about the Dolphins sitting there too. Like they've got to play the Storm. You know what oh. I mean? So, so these, like their finals football games. That like that's why the competition is so good and so so much quality in it because every single game's a must win. You know the Dragons play the Sharks. You know, and yeah. Sharks are trying to hold on to that fourth position. Um, the the Dragons are trying to hold on to that eighth position, and then. You got the doggies that are wanting to get the fourth position. They play the Warriors, so like these games are exciting games because it's for something. It means something, but it means something in the context of the competition and where they end up finishing up. So, man, she's just getting bigger and better in the back end of the season here. Thursday night crackers, for sure. And we'll go into the last game of the of the round: Sharks versus Knights at points bet. 19-18 to the Sharks mm. in Golden Point. Daniel Atkinson, again, man, the guy's a hero for them. Yeah, um, it was a good game in the end. Uh, made it interesting. Um, before we start asking, before we start talking about it, man, what about these blockers? These blockers <laughs> at the end. Do you see them? Yeah. And I've, 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 I don't know. They didn't learn their lesson. They're known from the start that they're not allowed to be in there. You're not allowed blockers. And I like the fact that we're taking blockers out of the game. Yeah. I do, I'd, and and that they're penalised regardless of whether they're impeding a, de, a defender or not. The fact that they're in the line, uh, they're they're in a position where they can impede. Yeah, they're doing nothing. So, so my my question is, if they're running onto the ball, and you got your guy running there, that are they an option of getting the ball? If you're a block runner. So you know how they had those double double two players, yeah, kind of walking, moving onto it. If you're actually back running onto the ball, are you still a block runner? I don't think so. So is the correct the correct correction correction <laughs> correction for those block runners to be genuine leads. to be genuine runners to at the back? Is does that play on? I, I presume so. I presume so. You've got to be genuine. At because moment, a lot of the times they're just standing there. If, if you're standing there, you're not actually attempting to get the... You're not no. even a target to hit the ball. But if you come back in the, the correction from this, and I think people are going to... Uh, the teams or the coaches are going to work this out one pretty this out pretty quickly because they're seeing what happened on the weekend, is that they're going to have to be genuine lead runners, actually an option. In our minds, if I'm running that, we're not a genuine option anyway, but there's a way of mimicking or faking it. Yep. Then playing at the back to those the kickers, is that play on then? For mine, yeah. But I don't see any benefit in that because I think the kicker's just got to go further back. Do you yep. understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kicker's yeah. got to go further back. And if you're playing the ball at the 20 metre line, you're almost kicking past the 30 because, yep. the, because those lead runners are starting at least two metres and you want the ball back further. Well, you don't necessarily, you just need to be looking like you're running onto the ball, mm. which means if the ad line's on my couch here, you're just running from a metre back, looking like you're going to get the ball. They're still sitting in the same yeah. position. You know what I mean? So I think you got an attempt to look like you're trying to, if the guy was to hit you short, which, mate, it could be an option. And it's an argument you can have because if they go straight past them, 
Bam, short runner. I think what you'll find as well is defenders will run into them. Correct. Yeah, correct. Defenders will just run into them. Mm. And, and then they're a blocker anyway. Well, especially now yeah. that, that everyone's seen what happened, eh? Yeah. Because then, then obviously... You'll get they the marker, jump out and just... They didn't lose, learn their lesson. No. But then the last one, they had one block runner. Yeah. And he kicks it and he wins the game. What was the, What's the difference? I you don't know. I'm not sure. Because there was a there was a runner. Same thing. He just stood there. He didn't actually move onto the ball like he was going to get the ball. I think that was it. He didn't move. Whereas the other ones, Royce Hunt, well, so he you, was way up and almost engaging the defenders. So you can stand back and line on the ad line with two players just stand there? I think so. I, I think if you don't move at all, because I think that happened in the okay. Raiders versus Dolphins. Oh, so, you can still, so you can still have those two players. They just don't move. Yeah, they just have to stand completely still, okay. I think. Well, and not impede. Yeah. Well... Not impede, but the players are still going to run into them. Um, because I just saw, I didn't think I, when they kicked their goal, which I was happy for, for either team to win this game because yeah. I thought it was a great game. Everyone both had a crack at it. No one learned their lesson, but then I thought they still had one blocker there. What's the difference? But they gave it, and I'm guessing if they had a challenge because both ran out of challenges, they may have wanted to challenge it. I thought the same thing when, um, who's the, the Sharks fullback again? Kennedy. Kennedy. I thought he was maybe offside. They didn't even look at that. They just looked at the block runners. So there was moments in there that could have gone either way. But I thought it was a pretty good game. Knights had a lot to play for here. So did the Sharks, obviously. But the Knights, um, you know, tried hard, brought themselves back into the game off the back of Kalen Pong and what he's been able to create. I think he's right. when he gets going with his speed outside of players, it's not necessarily because I, I like when he, he gets, especially when he goes the left side, He's got that sharp ass, and it's not even a step, it's just a little jink and then comes back off his left foot and ducks in behind players. So anytime he gets the ball, he can get on the outside, but he can also just go stop in an instant and just cut back in yeah. here. Um, I think that's a good big play for, for the Knights, and he did that a couple of times, poked his nose through, then played short. Greg Marge, scores a nice try in the corner. I thought there were some really good moments for both teams. Uh, Britton, Nikora. Uh, he's been he's been beast uh, the way he's run Talakai's been strong like their their back rows are coming into some form alongside a couple of their big middles doing some really good things um, is Cameron McKinnon still playing nine yeah Mate, yep. he, like him in the middle of the park because he's just a busy player like him being involved in the game all the time like, even with his ball skills I think he's been quality for them as well and he's not going to not let you down he turns up he's a bit like a Cameron Munster or Cam, Cam Murray I think when he plays he's just like forever in there working his butt off you know he comes off the field he's got cuts all over his face his teeth are hanging out <laughs> like he is he is a war horse for them like Cam Murray is but then i got to give credit to Daniel Ackerson I think to ice that after obviously both having those moments, I think the question mark was for me is the Knights set up at, at the black dot, got Kalen Ponga, which you knew he wasn't going to get the ball because it's on the wrong side, and then you got... Um, Campbell? No, no, the, the, the other Crossland. half four. Crossland. Crossland. Phoenix Crossland sitting up on that side. You always knew they are going to go to Phoenix Crossland, and he just didn't hit it, didn't ice it. I think mm. when you're going to hit those moments, you want to get it to your number one man, and... Rather than trying to overcomplicate things, get to the right points, let him have a crack and put it on all his shoulders because I think he's the man of the moment. He was the guy that's going to win you the game. And I think they just kind of most probably let down Phoenix in that moment where it's like, although he most probably wanted it, I just think they should have gone to the right side of the post for the left footer to kick their goal and Kalen should have been the man kicking it. But unfortunately, 1918, that's the scoreline. And it's a loss. <laughs> Yeah, I picked I picked the uh, the Sharks because of form and and where they sit in the table and the Knights being inconsistent and throughout the game I'm pulling out my hair thinking come on Sharks you got to get this one out um, the Knights were very good the Knights were, were great for them um, Frizzell and um, Gagai on the right hand right edge dangerous mm. strong again uh, they just need to have those images and those performances more often. They're capable of doing it. And we spoke about how they were when they lost Ponga. They won a couple and then they were going to fly into the eight when he came back. But just too heavily reliant on him, I thought. And that's as a playing group. And us that watch them, we expect a lot out of Kalen and he can deliver. But 
we expect that he's going to lift the team when he's got some quality around him still. The Sharks, and with with uh, Trindle and uh, Hines, you know, not there, especially yeah. Nico Hines. But like Lockie Gowan, they've had to fall back to Daniel Atkinson, who in the moments that he's been called in early in the year and then now, the kid's really stepped up mm. to the mark and looks like he's enjoying it. He looks like he's having fun leading the group. There's some over chases from, from the Knights. He puts on a couple of right foot steps and gets through to get the try that gets him back in there. And then obviously he ices the drop goal. And well done to the young fella. Well done to the Sharks. Um, on your way to the playoffs, and if you're going to go deep, you're going to have to be battle hardened. And this is what this game gave him. It gave him some experience to how to play and how to win. They'll recall on this at some point. I, I no doubt about they'll have a tight game in the playoffs and they'll fall back on some of this and ex these experiences and how to play the game when it gets tight like this. For the Knights, Tyson Gamble only just came back from an injury mm. and he's apparently broken his hand now, probably going to be out for the rest of the season, I imagine. They'll go back to Will Price, uh, Jackson Hastings, one of those they have Cogger. partnerships. Cogger. They have Cogger, Cogger yeah. yeah. So, again, I think we had this conversation early on in our shows um, about the mixing and matching of halves and how many different combinations that they've had. Um, they could even go for the Kalen Ponga, you know what I mean, and put Fletcher Sharp at the back. Because I don't know. I guess when you when you you're coming to these big games, you mostly want your big game players or your leaders in these in these right positions. Whether where we think Kalen Ponga should be there or play at fullback, where he's best. I think fullback. But when you're coming into must win games, I think um, having your your main men on the ball as long as they can free him up. Then I think he could he could do a job for them at the halves. I know they tried that earlier, it didn't really work. But I think they tried everything and nothing really worked. So, you know, it's 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 do or die. You know what I mean? You've got to find something. Whether they want to stick to some of those young guys, then it's up to them. But otherwise, I'd be saying put Kalen into the the halves and try and see what he can put more pressure on him. They've tried everything else. Yeah, they've tried everything else, and I don't think they lose anything. By doing what you're saying, yeah. put Sharp at fullback and then put Kalen into the halves and, and see where they can go from there. They've tried yeah. everything else. Cool. Well, um, we're going to wrap up this show, Willie, and appreciate your fellas' um, input, um, especially yours, bro, with your oh, Tigers. Thanks, up the Tigers. With the Tigers jersey on. Um, but so if you've um, made it to the end of the show, if you've made it to the end of the show and you sat with us, <laughs> and you heard all our conversations, I'd just love for you just to drop an emoji. Just drop me an emoji and tell me or just show me that you got to the end. But as always, I appreciate all your guys' love and support. Make sure you subscribe. Jump all over our YouTube channel. Subscribe there and also our TikTok on social media. And just a reminder at the top of the show, I did say that on Mondays at 9.15 to 9.45, we will be going live on our YouTube channel and our TikTok both Run it straight. Again, thank you so much. Rugby League is the winner. Cheers.